Since the very beginning, Xenoblade has been one of my favorite video games. Then, throughout the next decade, it became my favorite video game series, period. But today is a little different. Today, my love for Xenoblade 3 transcends my love for Xenoblade. In many ways, it is the culmination of a trilogy, but don't get it twisted. You don't have to be an existing fan to understand it and fall in love with it. Though it is considerably more special if you have played the previous entries, the story is delicately written so that anyone who hasn't won't feel confused or left out. It strives to form its own identity from the get-go with an unusually bleak premise. In the world of Ionios, killing is as much of a necessity for survival as water and food. Even then, a human's lifespan is merely 10 years, and so their lives will be consumed by an everlasting war between the nations of Kevis and Agnes. One of these encounters involved Noah, Lands, and Uni from Kevis, and Mio, Senna, and Tyon from Agnes. An otherworldly intrusion ends up forcing them to work together, but by uniting in victory, they have also suddenly united both nations in an effort to destroy them. Their only hope remaining is Sword March, where they will supposedly learn the truth about the war and Ionios. And as if their situation wasn't already dire enough, Mio is left only with three months of her ten years. Trust me when I say that these are minimal plot details. The adventure of these six soldiers will be far grander than you ever expected, yet exactly as emotional as you may have been fearing. Simply put, if you cannot handle heavy subject matter regarding death, then this story may not be for you. That being said, Xenoblade 3 isn't dismal for the sake of it. It leaves a powerful message on mortality, grief, sacrifice, and purpose. It never comes off as pretentious. It is a sincere reflection on life and death that at times is brutally honest. You may hear conversations you were always afraid to have, yet deep down you knew you always needed. As someone with depression and anxiety, I personally found it to be relatable and it genuinely uplifted my perspective on life. It made me value the privilege of having a choice, and sunk in how wrong it is for that not being a right. I put down my weapon, look around at my companions, and feel relief. Thinking, finally, another day down. Then I think of tomorrow and the tremors are back. Will I see the same faces when I wake? Will I even be around to see them? However, as easy as it is to condemn Ionios, the writers went far and beyond in portraying perspective. Not everyone in this world wants the status quo to change, and for reasons that are empathetic. Even the party isn't fully on board at first, and I like that. I respect how much the characters and the players' beliefs are challenged. It's uncomfortable to confront the nuance of what we like to believe is straightforward, but the story is all the better for it. And to top it off, it is delivered via some of the greatest cutscene direction in gaming. It can seriously range from feeling like an award-winning drama to a top-tier shonen anime. It's difficult to prove without spoilers, but all I'll say is that there was an entire hour that I was crying, on and off. That's how engrossing the story is. On the flip side, this may amount to a potential downside. Xenoblade 3 has the longest cutscenes in a franchise that already had long cutscenes. I emphasize potential downside because it just depends on your tastes. For instance, the Yakuza series has even longer cutscenes, but its popularity is only growing. Nonetheless, don't mistake the length as a crutch. The writers are exceptional at making you warm up to characters in a brief period of time. The main cast is exemplary. Though Noah and Mio are the leads, each party member is fleshed out with meaningful character arcs, defined relationships, and numerous chances to shine on their own. Their chemistry, significance, and presence is always felt, and that's rarer than you may think. 
In terms of favorites, I think I'm leaning towards Senna and Tyon. It's impossible for me to choose, but they stuck out to me more than I expected. Now when it comes to antagonists, there is a plethora. And although most are effective, I do have to admit there are specifically two of them that aren't as compelling as I was hoping. One of whom is the main antagonist. They do serve their purpose, but I find them to be the weakest main antagonist in the Xenoblade trilogy. Last bit about the writing. Expect to frequently hear the colorful lingo and profanity of Ionios. The most common by far are Spark and Snuff, but my favorite hands down is Queen's insert random object here. Queen's wings, have you lost the snuffing plot? Queen's beans. Though ridiculous as it may be, it is a welcome addition to the classic Xenoblade charm. What pushes Xenoblade 3 from a fantastic story to a phenomenal game is its addictive gameplay. There is so much to do and so much incentive to do them. Not that you would need incentive to explore because, as per usual, the world design is captivating. Ionios may feature elements from Xenoblade 1 and 2, but it never feels too familiar. It is breathtaking in its own right. Spark, a more apt comparison, would be to Xenoblade X. This game may not be truly open world, but the freedom and content is reminiscent. There is a substantial number of areas that won't be discovered in the main adventure, in spite of it being constantly on the move. The most notable example is the towns, or colonies in this case. I was shocked by how many colonies there are and how many are reserved for the player's exploration. Of course, each colony is full of NPCs, all of whom and their relationships can be tracked with the affinity chart. Although I personally never cared for it, conveying these bonds to this extent is valuable to world building. By strengthening our own bond with the colonies, we'll be treated to exclusive rewards. This is done with a variety of interactions, such as completing side quests and honoring the dead bodies that couldn't make it home. Yeah, to reiterate, this is not the happiest game. Aside from corpses, between the major landmarks are collectibles, loot, super bosses, and rest spots, an iteration of campsites from Torna. Here, the player can craft gems, cook food, and use EXP from exploration and side quests. The convenience is encouraging on its own, and it's further embellished by animations that imbue personality. Though, as much as I adore rest bots, they do remind me of my biggest disappointments with Xenoblade 3. The lack of Heart to Hearts. Heart to Hearts were skits that took place all around the world. They were basically a fun excuse to characterize the party without being tied to a story or side quest. To be fair, every feature that did return has been highly elevated, and it's not like there's a shortage of characterization, but I'd be lying if I said this omission wasn't felt. Especially when there's a slight resemblance in discussions. By eavesdropping on NPCs, the group can discuss topics that may transition into full-on side quests. While some of the conversations are entertaining, there are a bit too many side quests that follow this trend. After a while, it starts to feel less like a natural discovery and more like an arbitrary process. At worst, this is a nitpick, because the side quests themselves are immensely solid, perhaps my favorite overall in the Xenoblade series. This game is bountiful with characters and storylines to get invested in, the most ambitious involving heroes. Hero quests typically provide much more context and quality, to the point that a handful are mandatory. Honestly, I think a few of them shouldn't have been for the sake of pacing, but that doesn't mean they're ever dull or boring. Even if you're the type of player who ignores side quests, I strongly recommend doing the hero quests because they are a highlight. Besides, they're not called heroes for nothing. Once their quest is completed, heroes can fill in as a seventh party member, and although they aren't controllable, they do introduce a brand new class to the party. Now before we tackle the battle system, allow me to clarify something. In order to make this video beginner friendly, I've tried to keep comparisons to the previous Xenoblade entries to a minimum. So if you happen to be wondering, I'll generalize it as much as possible. On the surface, and I do mean that both figuratively and literally, it's more like Xenoblade 1. 
but in actuality, it builds remarkably on the major elements of 2, including the storytelling, the narrative themes, and the combat. In fact, calling this game a return to form would be a declaration of bias or ignorance. It certainly feels like the combat was aiming for a sweet spot between Xenoblade X and 2, and that couldn't have been more of an excellent decision. For the first time in the franchise, Xenoblade 3's combat features up to 7 party members at once, and the player can switch between the main 6 at their discretion. Depending on their class, each party member will be designated as one of three roles, attacker, healer, or tank. By playing these roles efficiently, they'll be able to unleash a special move known as a talent art. Arts in general are abilities that provide offense, healing, and other special effects. The main six party members can accumulate a myriad of arts that are divided into two sets, class arts and master arts. Class arts are determined by the party member's current class, while master arts are mixed and matched from previous classes they've experienced. Notice how arts come in two different shapes. Circle arts belong to Kevis and recharge over time, whereas diamond arts belong to Agnes and recharge by using arts or standing still to auto-attack. The distinguishment is crucial, as class arts and master arts cannot be the same shape, so a Kevesi class can only integrate master arts from an Agnian class and vice versa. This caveat strikes a nice balance in maintaining customization that is generous yet thought-provoking. Not only was it fun to play all these different classes, but it was rewarding to discover their synergy both in team structure and master arts. For instance, inflicting arts with these sequences of effects is extremely beneficial. Problem is, most classes only have one of these arts, some don't even have any, but what makes these combos ideal is the synergy with master arts. And as further incentive, class arts and master arts can be performed simultaneously as fusion arts. Doing so will gradually increase the interlink level, culminating with the enhanced potency of Ouroboros. Ouroboros are exceedingly powerful beings that can be temporarily formed by three specific pairs of the main characters. When the transformation expires, the interlink level will be reset and there will be a hefty cooldown until it can occur again. Ouroboros can make or break the battle, they can swiftly turn the tides in your favor if implemented wisely. But if that's not enough to save the day, there is one final trump card, Chain Attacks. When the gauge is full, the player can ensue a lightning round of attacks that will require a bit of math. A round begins by choosing an order belonging to a party member. Each order can only be chosen once, and when fulfilled, it will result in a special reward as well as a massive attack. To complete an order, the player has to accumulate at least 100 TP with their party member's arts. A number of variables determine the amounts of TP gain, it's something to be learned through experience. When chosen, a party member cannot act again until they are reactivated. Reactivation can be influenced by several factors, including a higher total of TP. And thus, the player will continue to complete orders until they either mess up or the chain attack gauge depletes. While it may be confusing at first, chain attacks will quickly become thrilling. The music and calculations never fail to pump me up. I mean, how could you not get excited over multiplying your damage output by hundreds, even thousands? If it wasn't obvious by now, Xenoblade battle systems are quite complex. There are many details I'm leaving out. The boss battles in particular can test your endurance. If you don't have a grasp on the mechanics, you are not going to have a good time. But don't let this intimidate you. To quote my Xenoblade 2 retrospective, the detail is less of a barrier to entry and more of a reward for effort and experimentation. I know plenty of gamers who aren't into complex mechanics, yet Xenoblade has become a favorite for them. As long as you are trying to learn, you will learn everything you need, especially with the best tutorials and quality of life features in Xenoblade history. Granted, as Xenoblade fans, we have to be self-aware and understand that most gamers are going to dismiss the combats as too complicated or unnecessarily complicated. And as tragic as that is, I can't blame anyone for preferring a simple battle system where what you see is what you get. 
However, I also believe it is worth giving a shot, because if you do happen to enjoy the combat, there is nothing else like it. The combat is so exhilarating, I cannot tell you how many times I loudly celebrated over winning an intense battle. It gracefully achieves the heights of 2's battle system while being more approachable like 1's. It is a quintessential example of taking everything you've learned and making the absolute best of it. The single gripe I have is the length of chain attacks. Each order has a spectacular animation, and since chain attacks happen often with multiple orders included, that means they'll be eating a significant chunk of time. If there was a patch that added a fast forward button, I would not hesitate to officially deem the combat flawless. And in spite of that blemish, in the moments, I still feel as though I am partaking in perfection. Xenoblade 3 is not just the best game in an incredible franchise, it deserves to be in the conversation for the greatest JRPG of all time. Yes, the detailed mechanics of Xenoblade will never be as widely appealing as a straightforward battle system, but it resonates with so many people and for us, it is irreplaceable. And no matter where you stand on that, I challenge you to find another JRPG that is as plentiful as it is consistent with this level of storytelling, character work, world design, world building, cutscene direction, and soundtrack all at the same time. While others may have reached these heights, Xenoblade 3 lives on them. It is comfortable in its status as a masterpiece. I truly believe it is genre-defining, and for me personally, it was life-defining. Look, I think we can agree that as dreary as Ionios is, our world can seem just as hopeless at times. These past few years have especially been tough for everyone, and some of us just have it tough no matter what. And perhaps it's ironic, but a journey through a darker place can be the spark of a brighter hope. Although I shed countless tears throughout this experience, I would always end up wiping them with fulfillment. Its message is as profound as it is inspiring, and I wish that everyone will encounter it one way or the other. So if you need something to confide in, something to escape from reality and return with the strength to face it, then Xenoblade 3 may just be the masterpiece life needed. I know it doesn't mean much for me to say, because you guys know I'm a long-time Xenoblade fan, but like, I just think that game was phenomenal. It's definitely my favorite game. I just... I think its message was so important too. I know it's, it's not that hard to make me cry, but I just felt a lot what they were saying. I really needed to hear. But it's also nice just to see, you know, I've been a fan for like a decade for this series. <laughs> and this, just to see it turn out exactly how I want it. <laughs> I'll never forget this feeling. <laughs> 